uh, Genesis, Genesis chapter 12 this morning. And as I was reading a bit of the text about Abram, there was something just jumped out at me that I'm not sure I really grasped before, <clears throat> but I've certainly grasped it now, and I want to bring that to you. And the title this morning is this, and this should be revealing to you, and you will be a blessing to others. That's the title, and that's what's spoken over your life according to the Scriptures. And you, that, that's you, yes, you, you will be a blessing to others. Why? Because God has said so. God has ordained it as so. And I often think about why the enemy attacks us and various things, and, and all I know is when he gets in on us, one thing we're not is a blessing to others. One thing we're far from is a blessing to others. And that's the title, if you're taking notes, and you will be a blessing to others. We're going to be reading about the calling of Abram, how God called him and blessed him then to be a blessing to others. That's what the Scripture says. So let us read then um, verse 1, chapter 12, verses 1. <clears throat> so the Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation. <clears throat> and I will bless you and make your name great. And listen, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on the earth will be blessed through you. And so Abraham departed. He rose up and he walked into what God called him to. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. Now he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran. And he headed for the land of Canaan. And when they arrived in Canaan, Abraham traveled through the land as far as Shechem. And there he set up camp beside the oak tree of Moreh. At that time, the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Just an interesting side note. See Shechem. At that point, it was a Canaanite stronghold. It was full of idolatry. And later on in history, that very place would become the first capital of Israel, a place where the, Holy, where the Lord was lifted up, a place where all idols were cast down. Isn't that something? How he takes the life out of idolatry, out of paganism, and makes it a place where God is honored. Anyway, that's a side note. We'll move on. Verse 7, then, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants, which is a prophecy, promise that I've just explained to you. And Abram built an altar there, and he dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. And after that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country, with Bethel on the west and Ai to the east. And there he built another altar, and he dedicated it unto the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. And then Abraham, or Abram, continued traveling south. I love how my trans translation puts it, by stages. What a picture of the Christian walk, by stages. Has anybody perfected their walk with God yet? By stages, by stages. Abram had a walk by stages. We rest assured, you and I do it by stages. So Abraham here, as an introduction, is called by God, and he's blessed by God to be a blessing to the world. I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to others. And that's what really jumped out of me. Something wonderful there in our calling as everyday women and men who try to get on with life and live for God. By stages, we will bless others because God has called us to do so. In the story of redemption, we often talk much about how the church is called to go and to preach the gospel and to reach the world, and rightly so. How we often talk about how we can change the landscape around us because God has transformed us and anointed us to do so. We often talk about national revival. Oh Lord, please come and revive the nation. But how often do we look or sometimes overlook the small everyday calling that rests upon your life and upon my life? The wee things that, are, that really are important to us and what God has called us to do. If God does revival, that's God's work. But what about the work he's called you and I to do? What rests upon us to do every day in life? And the commission is simply this, to be a blessing to others. We're called to be a blessing to others. Do you realize you're a blessing to others? Do 
Now, it's too early to be going to sleep now, church. Do you realize you're a blessing to others? Do you know before you were saved and you rubbed shoulders with Christians, did they not do you good in some way? Now, they might have done you a bit of harm telling you some truths, but did they not do you good? Was there not something about them that you just sensed you wouldn't mind a bit of that? We're, we are anointed to bless others. We are given a, a special bless. We've been blessed of God, and out of that overflow, we give on to others. Blessed to bless others. A Christian who understands this biblical truth will live differently, and I pray you leave here living differently. I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to others. Now, there are some factors that hinder us from being a blessing. Our emotions, our circumstances at times will influence our behavior. If you're having a bad day, listen, just have your bad day. You're not going to be much of a blessing. Just accept that. If you have to just get on and whatever you do, do it. There's, that, there's, that, there's seasons that not every day is going to be a day, but we are all called and anointed to do that, to bless people. But listen, there's things that hinder us, but one thing that doesn't is age. It doesn't matter what age you are, you're called to be a blessing, anointed to be a blessing. I want to just speak to the young person for a moment. Young person, you're never too young to be a blessing. You're never too young to take your place and take your stance within the church, within the community, and stand for God and live for God. What are you waiting for to get to your 25? Live for God now, young person. Now. Give your good days to Him. Live for Him now. In your homes, be a blessing. Yes, in your homes, young people, be a blessing. In your schools, your colleges, your work placements, your place of work, wherever you find yourself, be a blessing. Be a person that people will be glad to see you come in to the room. We're not, all, we're not all greatly received, you know. Some people see some Christians coming and they close the door or run out the back door. Don't be that person. Be one that blesses. Be a blessing in this hostile war, war, world and warm the hearts of people. And you know what, I, as I considered this, I realized it takes work to be a blessing to others, doesn't it? Doesn't it, church? Come on now. It takes work. It takes work. It doesn't always happen naturally. In today's pace of living, we must make a conscious decision to clear some space in our calendar and make time for people, especially people the Lord has put on our heart, to listen to people. Very few people listen to anybody today. To be concerned about others. Do you know, we all can easily become so self-focused. It's, it's actually so easy nowadays to be so self. I'm speaking to this heart too. So self-focused. But young people, to be a blessing in this community, to be a blessing in this church, to be a blessing in everywhere you walk, there's something you must learn. You must learn to walk with God even when some people undermine who you are because of your age, because of your lack of experience in their eyes. We must learn to walk with God despite what some people think of us or how they undermine us. And we see this in the life of young Timothy. There were those who looked down on this young man of God because of his youth. And would one, think, one would think that the church would be encouraged to see young men rise up and want to go on for the Lord. But this was not the case. Some made his life very difficult. And I want to say this, young person, listen, and to us all, but I'm speaking to the young, but to, it'll, it'll be for us all. If you decide to go on for Christ, expect difficulties. Actually, that's for us all. It's for us all. Expect difficulties. Because people will get in your way, and it'll often be those who you thought would encourage you on in your life. Now, Paul speaks into the young minister in training's life in 1 Timothy 4, and he says this, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth, because of who people think you are. Don't let anybody rob you of your calling, Timothy. Be a blessing. Be a blessing to others. I wonder if there's some of you here, and you're not being what God's called you to be because of other people. Maybe some people in the room. Is there a reason why you're not being what God's called you to be? Who's in your life that's holding you back from stopping you from taking your stand? But Paul speaks into this young man, and he says, regardless of your age, Timothy, or what people will think about you, or even say about you or to you, be an example to other believers, it says. Be a blessing. Be an example. 
If you don't know what your calling is today, Christian, understand it's at, at the very least, and it's a, it's a mighty calling, that's it. There's part of your calling is to bless, be a blessing um, to others. It's getting very warm in here, so if somebody wants to open them back doors, because if I fall asleep, you're in great trouble. If you fall asleep, I have to endure. But if I fall asleep, you are, well, we're all doomed. <clears throat> Here's the thing. We must, we each must make a conscious decision to look past how others see us and go on for God. Who here doesn't be hindered by others and how they see us? We all do. What such and such says about us. What such and such thinks about us. You have to learn to overcome such negativity. There's not one character in the Bible who went on for God that didn't face criticism, mockery, wasn't challenged. Who do you think you are? Even Paul, the great apostle who we revere, was rejected by many in the early church. The question is apostleship. How are you an apostle, Paul? Who made you this person? God did. But we must be an example. And Paul sets out five areas that a person can take a stand to be an example in this world. In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. There's five places of your life and my life that we can be an example to others. <clears throat> Christian, how does it feel to be reminded this morning that you are to be an example to others in this world? I pray you feel a wee bit of weight with that. How's your speech? How's your conduct? How's your love? How's your faith? How's your purity? These are the sort of things that the Word does. It, it, it takes us to the side and it says, Neil, consider your walk. How's your conduct? How are you going, Neil? How, how are you weighing up here? You know, our speech can be a blessing or it can be a curse. Our love can either heal somebody or cut them. Our faith can either strengthen other believers or weaken them. Our purity can encourage other people to pursue it. That's the power of a godly influence. So young people, if you choose to live for God, learn to look past what others say about you. Learn to live and walk in the calling in which God has called you to be. If you ever see a young person who's measured on all that I've just said and who are a good example in that they're, you actually humble us all. I've seen young people who have gone on for God and they challenge me in my walk with God. It's such an inspiration. It's such an opportunity to give God glory by saying, look at how that young person's living. Look at the stance they take for God. And it's wonderful to see. And I want to encourage a young person, press on for the Lord despite what anybody would say about you. And watch God bless you and use you to be a blessing to others. Now, I want to speak to the older people then. Now, that's those of you who are 47 and above. You're old. I'm 46. And next year I'll join you, but at the minute, I'm in the lower category. And I'm sorry if I've offended you, the rest of you guys, but look, life's tough. Life's tough. But older people, and of course I'm speaking to myself, be an encourager. Be an encourager. Everything, everything else you are falls to the ground when you don't become that. Your legacy doesn't mean anything without that, without being a blessing, without being an encourager without being the person that God has called you to be, be that, I promise you. You'll lose everything else. Be a blessing, be an encourager. You're called to be a blessing to others. Encourage the young people around you. Help them on and pray for them and tell them you're praying for you. Two times my own walk, one time I'd made the decision I'm going back to the world. I had a woman come up in a meeting and put her hands on my shoulders, starts praying in tongues and prayed into my life and I wondered what was going on. I thought there was some crazy person behind me speaking some foreign language. I didn't know what was going on. But I'll tell you what did go on that day. Lord, the Lord touched this heart. Before I got saved, I walked into a church reluctantly because I'd been invited to go several times. And I met this wee woman. I've told you this before, but listen, it's important. And this wee woman, she was no size at all. And she came up with a wee Bible. She had a wee limp. And she just says, Neil, I'm praying for you. And this hard heart that the world had made hard just cracked. And I sat there with the shoulders out and a tear in my eye. And that was the beginning of the end of my sinful living. It was long after that the Lord saved me. So pray for young people. Tell them you're praying for them. Encourage them. Amen. 
Come on now, amen. Amen. You know when somebody taxes you whether you're 90 and says, I'm praying for you, it's lovely. How much more are young people that need to be encouraged? Old people bless the people, encourage them. Encourage the young people around them. Be an example. You're never too young and you're never too old to be a, bl- a blessing. What age was Abraham? Anybody listening when I was reading this morning? Oh, you're brilliant. I feel the pressure now. You make sure I speak truth to you this morning. You're listening. He was 75, for those of you who didn't hear it this morning. He was 75 when the Lord called him to be a blessing. I could have said, you know, Lord, I'm too old. I'm too stuck in my ways. I'm too comfortable. We get comfortable. We build big containers as we get older. And we push everything in that we sit there and we're comfortable. You know what Abraham did? He had to open the door of, the, of, the, of, his, of his container and close it and walk on and leave it. And the Lord blessed him in so many areas of his life. I'm too comfortable, Lord. He didn't say that. In his 75th year, Abraham chose to rise up and to be a blessing and follow and honor God. Now, Abraham would be a blessing in the world in many ways. But maybe you're not sure of the main one. I want to bring that out. The main blessing would come through the Lord Jesus Christ who would come through his descendants. Now, in Matthew's account of the genealogy of Jesus, he starts with Abraham. Abraham. And he works his way right through until the birth of Jesus Christ. So there's Abraham, his son Isaac, then his son Jacob. Jacob then would be called Israel. And Jacob's 12 sons would become the 12 tribes of Israel. And through the Jewish nation of Israel would come the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would enter the world that first Christmas Day, which hopefully in a few weeks we will be celebrating that Christmas Day, that first birth of Christ. And in Christ and through Christ, the world would be blessed. Salvation would be offered for the sins of men. Now, I want you to notice the condition of Abraham's blessing. Uh, And it was simply this separation. Now, we're not going to get all legalism here this morning. If you're a sinner, you're going to struggle with sins. We are saved and we're cleansed. Separation doesn't mean we walk about like a nun or or a a monk, all right? Separation is simply defined as somebody who goes on with the Lord by stages. And they make mistakes. Abraham made mistakes, you know. He went to Egypt a few times, back to the old place of sin. But he pressed on with the Lord. He was obedient to the Lord. And separation is simply this, somebody who just goes on for God. Even though they make mistakes, even though they have bad days. Separation, somebody says, you know something? I don't want that. I'm going to go on with the Lord. I might trip, but I'm going on with him. That's separation. In my eyes, that's what I see separation is. Biblical separation is a believer who separates himself from the sinful ways of the world and chooses to live a different way. It speaks of being set apart for God. Young people, as I've said, live for God, be set apart. Do you blend in when you go to your classes, your workplaces? Are you just like the rest of them? Or do you stand out? Older people, when you're rubbing shoulders throughout the week in your workplace, wherever you go, do you stand out? Or is it hard to tell the difference? That's what being set apart is and separation is. It refers to a man or woman who lives for Christ and goes on with them. Now, the four conditions for Abraham was this. Separation from his country, his king's men, his father's house, and a new land. Now, when God saves a person, he takes them out of the world, cleanses them, removes their sin, and he puts them back into the world as a witness, a light, and as a blessing. Now, the, the enemy seeks to fill the life of the believer again with all the worldliness. You notice that? All the things that the Lord took off you and out of you, he tries to put them back into your life. <clears throat> That's the work of him. He wants to see you fail. He wants to mock God with your life. But God removed these people. He moved you and he, and, and he removed all this ungodliness, but he tries to put, the enemy tries to put it back in. Be careful of that. Now, now quickly, listen, Leviticus 20 tells us we're separated by God from among the peoples. If you're saved, he's pulled you out. You're different. He's put you back in, but he's pulled you out. Romans says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Colossians says, set your minds on things above, not on the things below. You'll be broke. You'll be wrecked. You'll be sinful. You'll be discouraged. Eternal things. Listen to what Psalm 4 says, verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. When we choose to live for God, he uses us for himself. He draws us on to himself. And then it says, and the Lord will hear when I call, the psalmist says. The psalmist knew that he lived for God in a certain way that that honored him, and God answered his prayers. Separation is still the duty of the church. And with it comes much blessing. And maybe for some of you, 
need to be reminded of the importance of separation. There's things you need to get out of your life. And we'll leave it there. Amen? We'll leave it there. There's maybe things we need to get rid of them. But I'm pretty sure there is things we all need to get rid of. So let's not pretend, all right? There's things we need to get rid of. Now, Abraham was blessed by God. And the blessings of Abraham is upon the believer. Now, if you're attentive this morning, you'll say, how does the blessings of Abraham be transferred to us? Well, the Bible tells us as much. Galatians 3 and 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessing promised to Abraham would come to the Gentiles in Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now, God made Ab Abraham a sixfold promise, which includes being a blessing. <clears throat> I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And this was repeated over and over throughout his life. And I will make your name great. Who's got a name like Abraham? Known throughout the world. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. Such protection and favor. But in what way was Abraham a blessing to others? Well, when we look at Abraham's life and how he lived and blessed others, we in return can learn from him. So I want to push in in these remaining moments and consider how Abraham blessed others. Now, I encourage you to take notes because this is just, you'll be thinking about the steak, I promise you, the Yorkshire puddings. You need to be attentive. Abraham blessed others by his faith. By his faith. He believed God. He wasn't one of them Christians who was filled with doubt. And I don't know about you, but when I walk alongside a man or woman who, who knows what they believe, they sharpen me. When I rub shoulders with somebody that doesn't really have any real deep faith, of some sort of, not, of, of confession, but they don't really believe God, it doesn't do me any good. Abraham, if you rub shoulders with Abraham, you become rock solid. He took God seriously, and he took his word seriously, and it was proved by his living. He got up and he did, and he went to a land, after a land, that he didn't even know where the land was. He wasn't half-hearted, a bit like the church of Laodicea we looked at last week. Now, James says this, James 2, 23, Abraham believed God. Christian, do you believe God? And it was accounted to him as righteousness, and then he was called a friend of God. You know, you're a friend of God, not because of what you do, but because of your faith. If you feel God isn't pleased with you, listen, he's not looking at your works. He's pleased with you because of your faith you've placed in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Abraham's faith helps our faith. He, he was a man who was sturdy, rock solid. He proved God. And as we look to him, he can help us grow and steady our faith. Now, he blessed others in his walk. Here's what Abraham was, a peacemaker. And we need a few more of them and today like never before. In Genesis 13, Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen were at odds. We know, we know about the tensions that was in the camp. And there's lessons about that. This is a camp, if you like. There was tensions in the camp. And Abraham said, let there be no quarreling between you and me, between my herdsmen and yours, for we are brethren. Brethren, let there be no quarreling among us. We're brethren. He was a peacemaker. He was a man of reason. He was a man of grace. He was a man who was unselfish. In Genesis 13 and 9, he gives Lot the first choice of the land to take for himself. That is not what you and I would do. We'd be saying, right, Lot, you see that wee bit of dust over there with one bit of grass on it? You take that. Do you see this big lushful ground here heading towards Sodom? We're going to go down here. But he didn't do that. He says, right, Lot, you choose. You choose. He was a peacemaker. He was a man of integrity is a man of unselfish nature. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right, he says. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Sometimes that's the, the only way to move forward as a man of God or a man of woman is just stop fighting over silly things. Move on. Abraham, in a bid to honor God and keep unity, let Lot choose what Lot he wanted and let him go on. And God blessed Abraham as Abraham blessed Lot. There's something in that. You know what the scripture says? He who waters will be watered. When you bless others, God will bless you. And he gives Abraham all the land that he can see. It's a wonderful story. Now, Abraham was also a man who was faithful with his money. He blessed people with his money. How are you this morning with your money? 
Is there any misers among us? Or any real generous people this morning? Anybody who doesn't like to put the hand in, take out? Abraham was a man who blessed with his money. In Genesis 14, we read about Abraham after Lot and all was taken captive and the whole story went in and rescued them. They were making their way back, thanking God for saving his family. That's what the work of the church does, reach his people. And he met a man called Melchizedek. And, and he gave him a tenth of everything he had. He was a high priest. And what we see is that we too are called to bless others with our money. Now, tithing and offerings, very quickly. Tithings is what we tithe into the local church for the work of the ministry. We commit to that. Offerings is everything out of sight of that. We go to give, and that's what the biblical principles is. We tithe into our local church. It keeps the building running. But everything outside of that is called an offering. We do special offerings. We're going to be doing one for the youth soon, for the work of the youth ministry. That'll be an offering. We do that for missions, as offerings. We, you know, that's, we, look, many of you know that. Some of you don't. So tithing is that we dedicate so much and we give to the local work. And then offerings is everything outside of that. Now, we don't give 10% of some men preach. That was an Old Testament theme. In the New Testament, we give generously and with a cheerful heart, which is, in one sense, when you think of it, who wants to give their money with a cheerful heart? And who wants to be generous when we're giving it out? But that's what the Lord says. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart and give not reluctantly or under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. You know what Abraham was? A cheerful giver. He gave 10% ten, ten of everything he had and Abraham was a very rich man. I fail straight away. There's no way I'm taking everything that I have for all I have and breaking it into the tenth. But Abraham did it. He did it. He gave tenth on and the Lord continued and continued to bless the man. So I want to close now in a few minutes because you've been listening well. And this is one that I want to close with because I've reminded you that you're a blessing. You're called to be a blessing. Abraham worshipped God. Abraham worshipped God. Do you know everywhere he went, he brought God with him. Some Christians leave God at home and take him out only on a Sunday. Do you know what I mean by that? There's some, there's some people just take him out of the cupboard on a Sunday morning and say, come on, Lord, we're going to church. Oh, they've lost their way. That's not the way. And that was not Abraham's way. In Genesis 12 and 7, so Abraham built an altar there to the Lord. He was on his journeys, stages by stages. He built an altar to the Lord. And everywhere went, he built an altar to the Lord. And again then in Genesis 12 and 8, we're told that Abraham moved on towards Bethel, on towards Ai. And there he built an altar to the Lord and he worshipped. And he worshipped. He took God with him everywhere he went. The altar speaks of a life that's separated unto God. It's not about a perfect walk, doesn't exist. But one who is faithful, one who loves the Lord and desires to go on. And Abraham, everywhere he went, and he made mistakes now. We, we, we looked at that one a, first, a few years ago on how Abraham was on the journey. But every time there was something, maybe he would stop back into Egypt. And he, instead of trusting God in the time of famine, he went down to the pagans and got food where the Lord would have provided. Look, he made many mistakes, as you and I do. But everywhere he went, he brought the Lord with him and he built an altar to the Lord. Maybe your altar hasn't been open for a while, some of you. Maybe it's been a while from you set before the Lord and done business. Maybe some of you needed to ask them to heal your heart, to do heart surgery. You know, things happen in our lives that wound us so deep, so deep that it's impossible sometimes to sing a song. Sometimes it's so hard to pray because there's such a deep disappointment or hurt or something you just can't understand. And when we just open the altar, come before and sit with the Lord, He heals our hearts. You ever experienced that? Where you're so broken or so bitter or so just, just want to give up. And, and, and then you find yourself at the altar. Just you and Him, you and God. <laughs> and it's wonderful. He just does something. Doesn't say anything, but He just does something. Abraham, in all of his journeys, brought the altar with him. And I think some of you, you need to bring the altar with you again. Get it open. Get before him. Get on your knees and you will be a blessing to all around you. Amen. Amen. We will be a blessing. 
Don't let the en enemy rob you of your calling. Neil, don't let the enemy rob you of your calling. Put your name there. I will bless you, the Lord says, and you will be a blessing. So as we finish today, and we are finished, the way we say this, and then 20 minutes later we're finished. I want to speak something over your life. Um, it's Aaron's blessing that we read in the Bible. I actually sung at the blessing before. And when Aaron, who was Moses' brother, was made the high priest, um, God gave him instruction. He says, I want you to speak this over my people. I want, to, I want you to bless them. It's called the blessing over God's people. And that's what God wants to do. He's for us. He's for you. And he wants to bless you. And he has called you to be a blessing. And no matter how you feel this morning, you are a blessing. You're a blessing to us in this church. You are a blessing to the people in your workplace. You are a people who bless people. You don't realize it, but you are. And the Lord said to Aaron, speak this over my people. And I want to speak this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Are you receiving this this morning? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up your countenance, his countenance toward you and give you peace. Speak that into your life this morning. The blessing of God, the favor of God, the peace of God. He's blessed you. You didn't deserve to be saved. You don't deserve to be called a child of God, but we are. And he's blessed us and he's called us to be a blessing. And I pray you leave here today and ask the team to come with a fresh, a fresh sense of calling that you're blessed to be a blessing. Will you repeat that with me? Blessed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. Write that on your, don't write it in your foreheads, it look really weird. Write it in your hearts.